Thank you. Okay. So um, if you're at home and you want to take screenshots of my slides, feel free. Um, also, you can email me after this and I will send you the slideshow. And if you're here in the room, please take pictures of it. Take anything you want off of the slideshow. It's, it's open to everybody. So, so the icon quiz, we're going to go over that. We're going to talk about why branding recognition, brand recognition is important. We're going to talk about logos, what makes them successful, what makes them a failure, because that does happen. And I'm going to show you a funny little video about some typefaces that we don't use in graphic design. <laughs> um, and then we're going to talk about what typefaces are good to use and what fonts and logo lockups. And I'll explain the difference between typeface and fonts and logo lockups later. I'm going to show you what a style guide should look like so that your logo has uh, standards and specifications so that you uh, that it stays the same across the board. And we're going to talk about when, where, and the placement of logos in marketing and merchandising your brand, which is important. And then lastly, um, I passed out a paper here locally and online. There'll be a slide at the end that you can screenshot um, about where you can get local graphic design resources and also resources online. So, and then we'll end with a question and answer. So I am going to to this, let's find this. Okay, can those of you at home see that? Go ahead and unmute if you have to. Not, maybe not. I guess they can also, so I'm going to go ahead. <clears throat> okay, so this logo quiz, you have 10 seconds to write down the names of the logos on each slide. Oh, and it went already, so I'll pause that. <laughs> so there's the first slide. You can either say them in your head or write them down if you want. Oh, somebody's talking. Where's the chat? Where's the chat thing? You might want to pause your team. Yeah. I'll go. I'll go through it again. Yeah. 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 Okay. I'm at eighty percent. Okay. I think they can see it. Oh, it's zero. <laughs> I'll start over again. So don't don't stress. <laughs> Some of these also, I think this quiz was made in Canada, so there's a few Canadian logos there, so sorry about that. <laughs> this was the best quiz I could find online. Okay, that should be it on that one. So let's start over. Do you guys want to go through it one more time? Okay, sure. So now it's going again. <laughs> 10 seconds is pretty short. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Canadian logos, not so much. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the Canadian logos are, threw me off too, but all the other uh, quizzes I found were a little bit lame. <clears throat> Almost done. Four more after this one. <clears throat> okay, 
So that was the, here's the answers. So what did you guys think about that? How fast did you get most of them? Like a percentage wise. So out of 32, who got 30 of them? Did, did everybody get all 32? Everything that was not 30. <laughs> okay. Okay, does anybody wanna know the answers? I can show you the, I mean, if you're curious. Yeah, the Canadian ones are the only ones I didn't get either, so. So that was your first pop quiz. <laughs> And then um, let's go back to this. I have, I made up my own, so. Well, the point there is the instant recognition for that icon. Right, right? yep, so that's what we're gonna talk about. So, um, so can you guess my icons? So I'm gonna uh, we'll pop up here. All right, so. Let me move this guy out of the way. This one, you're not time. You can just guess these while we sit here. So I'll give you a couple minutes. And this is the fun part because I have snacks that match <laughs> all of these logos. Well, almost all. They're not all food. That's not a hint. So. <laughs> so how you guys are doing that? And sorry to those of you at home, you missed out on the snacks, but. <laughs> I'm sure we'll be doing more of these. I'll give you about another 30 seconds. That should be enough, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you either know or you don't. That's right. Yeah, okay. So is everybody here done? You think you're done? Did anybody get all 15, do you think? Okay, so I'm just gonna reveal all of them. Well, actually, let's call them out and then we'll see. So what's number one? Little Debbie. Yes. Levy. Okay. We got oatmeal pies. <laughs> <laughs> so feel free to pass these around. Pass these around. Thank there you, you go. All right. All right. What's number two? Frito Lay. Frito Lay. Right here in Williamsport, we have a factory. All right. We got some Frito Lay. And they actually they donated uh, sun chips too. They donate to us all the time. It's amazing. So pass these around if you'd like some snacks. What's number three? That was yes. That's a tough one. Yeah, this is why this is a tough one. So let's, oh yeah, goldfish. Very good. See, I, the reason, I'll explain why that was a tough one later. So there's goldfish right there. Okay, what's number four? Quaker oats. Quaker oats, yep. So we got Quaker rice, rice crisps. Okay. What's number five? Oh, there we go. Now I see it. Okay. What's number five? Pringles. Pringles, oh, yes. God. So interesting thing about Pringles. Pringles started out with a very classic old logo. Oh. And just recently, they have changed it to this. So the old Pringles, uh, he had a bow tie and he had brown hair and a brown mustache. And now he's just a general cutout with a mustache. Uh, what about number six? Target. Target. Interesting fact about Target, they tried to sue the underground in London because when they redid their logo in London for the underground, the subway system, their red circle with the underground across, Target claimed that they owned that red circle, that that is their trademark. Tried to sue them, it didn't work. Um, number seven? Snickers. Snickers. I don't know if we have Snickers here, but oh, we're... you better bring some Snickers. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have other goodies, though. Uh, number eight, Skittles. 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 So, yeah. so what's interesting about Skittles is that that's not the main logo. Skittles is made by, who are they made by? Mars. Mars, I think. So, but everybody knows that 
the, the Skittles, Fs. So there's three boxes of those. You want to pass them out, you can share them or whatever you'd like. What's number nine? Citibank. Citibank. Somebody said it. Yep. I, I'm sorry. I don't have money for you. So, <laughs> but, so uh, Citibank, Citibank is one of those logos I'll talk about briefly um, and how uh, savvy and amazing that logo process went. Uh, number 10? Walmart. 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 Yep. Number 11? Hershey. Hershey. Yes. Got it. See, I didn't know if anybody would get that. That was a hard one. There's lots of Hershey's. <laughs> number 12? Pigs. Yes. Oh. oh, I didn't know if anybody would get that one. Hey, we got peeps. It's only one packet, so if you don't Who mind sharing with your buddy. <laughs> yeah. Who said peeps? Who yeah, said it? Okay, you get and if you want to share, you can. So she got it. Thank you. <laughs> okay, now it's number 13. Pepperidge Farm. Pepperidge Farm. Now this is why I said the goldfish one was interesting because goldfish is made by Pepperidge Farm. But everybody knows the goldfish guy with the sunglasses and everything, right? Oh yeah. But it's made by Pepperidge Farm. Yeah. So, you know, there's like, there's that, it's not, it's not considered sister branding, but it's a subsidiary of Pepperidge Farm. What's number 14? Local people. Uts. 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 Oh. Yep. Sorry, I don't have much chips with me. <laughs> and number 15. Mars. Nope. Nope. I, this is the one I was going to throw everybody off for. Nope. It's not food. 3M. <laughs> 3M. What's that? 3M. So, good job. Sorry, I don't have some scotch tape to pass out either. <laughs> but, um, so here's the deal. So this is the interesting thing about this. All I did was take away probably about 90% of each of the photos. And all of you knew, most of them, all of them. So at least one person in this room, they could name every single one of them. How weird is that? That brand recognition is so important to marketing that you can see this all over. It's stuck in your face constantly. I used to be a beauty tech when I was in the military. I was a beauty tech for seven years. And this is when I opened my eyes to the fact that, like, we inspected people that came to the commentary in my face, we inspected people that went to uh, distributed in the dining facility. But I was in a grocery store looking around and saying, you see this every day. Have you ever noticed in the cereal aisle where they place yogurt cereal, you know, the sugary stuff at children's plate? You know, this is, this is, it sounds evil and, you know, magical, but it works. I mean, <laughs> they make so much money off of branding and brand recognition. So me, like today, I'm wearing Birkenstock too, but like, you probably would know this because Birkenstock has their Arizona that they're, like, you know, targeted standards. So everybody knows the Birkenstock looks like I'm wearing this too. So, who else is wearing this? Sure, yes. Yeah. And then when you think about your children or your grandchildren, the things that they see, well, my best friend has Under Armour. I need to get an Under Armour sweatshirt. They, it's that brand recognition and then it becomes popular. And it gets passed down to children as little as, you know, toddler size. So it's, it's amazing how it works. And the things that you recognize over time because it's constantly pushed in your face. So the, the term brand recognition refers to the ability of consumers to identify a specific brand by its attributes over one another. Brand recognition is the concept used in advertising and marketing. It is considered successful when people are able to recognize a brand through visual or auditory clues, which I'll get to, such as logos, slogans, packaging, obviously, you're all you know, reaping the packages here and colors or jingles rather than being explicit, explicitly exposed to a company's name. Companies are often conduct market research to, oh, companies often conduct market research to determine the success of their brand recognition and strategies. Okay, so I'm going to show you a video real quick. So do you feel violated? Like, do you feel like, yeah, you're like, you're being brainwashed, you know, and, and it sounds bad, but it's good because if you're a business owner, it's good. So, find the tab. Uh, use of iconography for yeah. identification. Yeah. yeah. We're ready for <laughs> Let's see, sorry about that. So, if I can ever move this stuff out of the way here. Okay. So, Speaking of, 
I'm going to show you a quick video. Unmute it here. So you know what that is? It's not the normal. That's the one my kids don't even watch TV and they know what that And that's the thing is like, even though they, they have cut off their commercials and they've mm -hmm. cut off some parts, but we still recognize it. Yeah. So, okay. So. so. Okay. So are these everyday gift boxes? No. Where are these gift boxes from? Tiffany. Tiff yep, <laughs> all the women in the room. Tiffany, you know. Wow. So this is a, this is also an amazing like brand recognition study. So, so the one thing that Tiffany did, I I actually got to meet um, the woman that redid the Tiffany logo uh, polisher. So she's married to Seymour Kloss, who is a, a famous. They're both famous designers, but Seymour Kloss was part of Pushpin Studios, which is was started by Milton Glaser, who designed the New I Love New York logo. So he's very famous in the design world. And uh, Seymour Kloss, if you ever want to check it out, it's really cool. There's a, um, there's a, he married Paula Scher, who redid this logo for Tiffany. And uh, she also did the Citibank logo. And the Citibank logo was an interesting story too, because they wanted something that like felt like rain, like the coverage of rain, and they had umbrellas to start and they had all this other kind of cool stuff. And she was like, oh, the T, it looks like an umbrella. So why not just put a red line above it? Bam. And that logo is one of the most famous logos out there. And so is Tiffany. Because Tiffany is one of those logos that doesn't have an icon. It's just words. It's just the letters that, you know, make the logo. So, and the other thing amazing that they have done with their merchandising and their branding is they have basically merchandise this color, the Tiffany color. So a lot of women know this color. I mean, men might know too. I mean, they, because they have to buy gifts for whoever, you know, but um, now they even make, they even make pistols with, they've, they've partnered with Smith and, Smith and Wesson, I think, or uh, yeah, Smith and Wesson. And they have guns in the color of Tiffany. They have glasses, they have shoes, they have clothing, they have everything, not just jewelry, not just lamps, like they started out. So, so do you think color can add value to your brand? <laughs> 
Yeah. So it's, it's so these are the things you have to think about when you're when you're branding your business. Will the color matter? Like, will it be one of those things that people recognize? So Starbucks, where is it? Green. Green. McDonald's, Golden Arches. You know. Um, so Target, obviously red. Walmart, blue and yellow. You know. So you can hold up something and say it, and you know the color. So that's what we're gonna do right now. <laughs> so without seeing where this bag is from. <laughs> Wegmans. It's from Wegmans, right? They have their logo on here, but it's it's branded right here. And it's on the side. And that's it. But you know it came from Wegmans because you, if you shop at Wegmans, if you have a Wegmans where you are, um, you see it everywhere. So, all right. Another goodie bag here. What name brand of uh, drill is this? The Walt. The Walt. Yeah. So, <clears throat> like, it's like, it's amazing. You don't even have to see the words. The walls. Put that there. And then, what name brand of notebook is this? It says five star underneath. Oh, me. Me, right. So, look at how simple that is. I don't know if you can see this at home, but yeah, like look at it. It's me, five star notebook. There it is. You know what it is. So, um, but this is obvious, but what, what name brand is this? Can you see it? Or I do have a light here. I should shine it on here. Sharpie. Somebody said Sharpie, right? Sharpie. Look at that. And I obviously, I mean, I mean, people that use these every day, I use them every day. You know, you're like, oh, that's their logo. It says Sharpie on the side. You know, some people think, well, it's 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 called a Sharpie, but it's it's the name brand of the of the pen because there's other permanent markers that what, aren't called. Sharpie. What's that called when a brand becomes ubiquitous with an instrument like Sharpie or? Uh, or yeah, or like Velcro or. Yeah. Um, there is a term for that, right? I don't know if there's a term for it other than the fact that it has become its identity. Mm -hmm. So the brand has become its identity. So I don't know if there's a an actual term for it. And personally, in my personal opinion, I don't think this logo is very good. <laughs> so if you think about, I'll, I'll explain later why, but because it's a marker, it, it speaks the voice of the brand. So it gives the brand its identity because the logo actually looks like someone wrote it with a Sharpie. So it works. And Here's another something you might have in your garage. This one's really gross WD40. too. Yep, WD-40. So look at that. This company has been around for ages and WD-40 gets gum out of your carpet. You know, so it works for all kinds of fun stuff. <laughs> um, let's see. What name brand of glue that is Elmer. that? Elmer's. Oh my gosh, imagine that. Orange top. Blue label, oh, and you know that it's Elmer's. I promise there won't be more tests. They used to have an animal, right? They, so yep, there is a there's a cow on it. Cow. Yep, yep, there is a cow on the top. Uh, what else do I got here? Oh, here's one that we it already says what it is, but what kind of tape is that? Scotch, scotch tape. But who makes it? 3M. So scotch is kind of like the Pepperidge Farm goldfish thing. So Scotch is actually a subsidiary of 3M. 3M makes everything. They like make everything, like medical equipment, anything is plastic pretty much. Here's, here's little sticky, you know, double-sided tape. And look, they have their logo all over it. And this stuff goes in the trash. So when you use this, you're peeling it off and you see 3M constantly, and then you just throw it all in the trash. So, but they even brand their packaging and they brand their, their backing to adhesives. So that is an opportunity for them to get their brand recognition. Oh, let's see, what else? What kind of playing cards are these? Bicycle. Um, Bicycle, yep, you got it. So you poker players out there, it's bicycle. So I don't know if you can see that at home, everybody, but yeah, so. I don't even play cards, and I knew that this was bicycle cards. Um, oh, you can see that on the back, but what kind of hand wipes are these? Wet ones. Wet ones. So wet ones. And look how they made the type look like water because it's wet ones. You know, it's it's another thing where they're using the the product 
to help brand there. And that is it. The last thing I have is just another scotch thing, also made by 3M. Anybody have any questions right now at this point? I mean, pick your color. Uh, oh, well, we'll get to that. <laughs> Very good question. Okay, so the process. We're going to play one more game. I'm going to have to stop sharing my screen for this one, though. So, all right. If you want, I can turn the lights off for this, too. All right, so we're going to talk about the process of making a logo. So this is one of the things that I get questions about all the time. How do you come up with your logos? How do you come up with the concept? Um, what, how much time does it take? That's the other question. How much time does it take to make a logo? And what is your process as you go through this? So the reason I'm gonna show you this is because I want you to know that you can have a vision in your head and make it become a reality. And it, it's not, I mean, I'm a graphic designer, it's what I do for a living, but if you have a vision, in your head, it can become a reality. And then if you can do it yourself, that's great because that's cheap for one. You don't have to pay a designer to do it for you. If you have the tools to do it, as in certain computer programs, you can do it yourself. You can even do it by hand and take it to somebody that has those programs and they can put it into a digital format for you. So we're gonna play this game. I have a company that is, they make, um, Vanilla extract. So, oh, I just noticed we have more snacks here too. Sorry, <laughs> Sorry. I wanna make sure everybody gets the snacks. Um, so this company, they make vanilla extract. They're a husband and wife, so mom and pop type of shop, small business. And they also infuse sugar with that vanilla extract. So they have, they, their two products right now, their two main products are the extract itself and then the sugar that's infused. And what they do is they take the, remnants after fermenting the, but they don't ferment it, they put, when it sits after a year, basically, and it becomes extract, they take the remnants from the, that they squeeze out, and they infuse the sugar. It tastes amazing. This is a real company. So, so um, they are a husband and wife team, and they come to me and they say, we're going to start this just small company, and we're going to test it out on family. We want a logo, and we want it to represent us as a couple. And the wife says, I represent an owl, my husband represents a raven. So we want it to be called Alan Raven. So I'm like, oh, okay. So I start like this. So the company name is Owl and Raven. So what I like to do is a word map or a word list or uh, whatever you want to call it, a brainstorming cl word cloud. There's all different names for it. So you know that it's a, Vanilla extract company and infused sugar. Okay, so what I do is I break it down. Owl, the and it doesn't matter, raisin. Sorry, my handwriting is terrible. So what do you think of when you think of an owl? A bird, right? Same with the Rita. Also, bird. What are some other things, attributes of an owl and raven? Big eyes on the owl. Big eyes, right? We can just, we'll start on the owl side right now. Nighttime. Nighttime, yep. Night or nocturnal. Um, what else? They're hunters. They're hunters, yeah. What other attributes? Any word that comes to your mind, nothing is the wrong answer. That's the thing that's great about brainstorming. I could say car, you know, like, <laughs> you know, really nothing's wrong. So you can say whatever you want. The sound they make. The sound. So hoot, right? Mm -hmm. Wise. Wise. Yep, very good. I'll pick one. Feathers. Does somebody want to say that? <laughs> what else? Talons. Talons, claws. Yeah. Anything else you think of? They fly. They can come in brown, gray. Sorry, my handwriting's messy. You get the point. Um, 
What else? Sometimes their eyes are yellow. Anything else? They send letters to Gryffindor. Say it again. They send letters to Gryffindor. <laughs> yes, there you go, Gryffindor. <laughs> Please don't judge me on my spelling of Gryffindor. I don't. Yeah. Um, ravens. What about ravens? Black. 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 Yeah, a lot of people are like. Smart. Very smart. Yep. Are they the ones that collect things? Yeah. Yeah, they collect things. Yep. They put that down. Collectors. Large wings. Large wings. Very they good. Also talk. Oh, yeah, I'll do that for. They do talk. Yeah, large wings for both sides actually. They talk. Yeah. Sometimes they call them, what's a flock of? Murder. Murder, right. So I always think of Edgar Allan Poe. Yeah. So there's all these things, like keep going, keep going. We could go for another hour, you know, because once you start going, you just, I have pages in my notebooks of just words, words after words. So then when I get to that point, I take the words and I combine them. And I'm thinking to myself, what can these be? So I start to sketch. And if you're not a good drawer, it doesn't matter. If you just sketch, it's so good for you anyway. Just sketch it out. And whatever comes to mind, it, it doesn't matter if it looks like this with legs like that. To me, it's still a raven, you know, because you know. So then when you get, do, get going through all this, I'll erase some of it. Did you want to, anybody want to take a picture of that? Got one. So, once you get your words down, then you can start sketching. And I started thinking of like, when I did this logo, I started thinking, hmm, Alan, Alan Raven, maybe like a yin and yang because they're a married couple. You know, so I started doing yin and yang. And I'm like, how can an Alan Raven fit together like this? There's the owl. Maybe he's got some wings back here. Hmm, how can the raven fit? Let's see, this isn't quite working out. You could have a head there, but then it looks weird. So then I'm like, eh. And then I'll go through and I'll be like, oh, feathers. I could also do the yin and yang with feathers. You know, and this could be an owl wing and this could be a raven wing. And I was like, oh, it's, yeah, I'm getting there. And then I just keep going. I just keep sketching. And then finally, you know, sometimes the original sketches just don't work. You know, they're just not gonna work out. So then I'll go back to the drawing board and sometimes I'll just do something else just to get away from this logo because I've seen it too long and I just can't get over it. So then I'll do some research. So after I kind of have a sketched out idea, I'll do some research. So then I was like, oh, maybe I could combine them a different way. Now owls have really big eyes and usually their beak is about like here, but they have those eyebrows. I don't know what they're really called. I guess they're eyebrows. <laughs> the little feathers, the tufts that stick out from above their eyes. And I'm like, oh yeah, they have those eyebrows. So there's an owl with his little eyebrows. Looking kind of mean and intimidating. Maybe he looks cute. I don't know. So I'm like looking at him like, yeah, it's pretty cool. I like that. Now, how do I fit the raven in on this? Oh, so I like go back to the drawing board. I'm like looking at it. I keep looking at it and I go, oh my goodness, I see it. Here's a raven head. Raven head's here. This is the raven tail. And the talons come down here. You don't see it now, so I'll show you the finished version. But wings of the raven, eyebrows of the owl. Then two eyeballs under here is also the owl. And then this is the body of the raven. Cool, right? Okay, so now I'll show you the result. And it doesn't go that fast, I promise. Sometimes it takes me weeks. Sometimes it takes me days. Other times, it could take me a couple hours and it just hits me. So I'm gonna share my screen again. Does anybody have any questions? All right. All right, wake up. Okay. 
There is the result. Do this that way. Wow. So they liked that so much that um, oops, there we go. So they liked that so much that I didn't have to go back and do anything else. And so I basically took two attributes of two birds and made it one logo. And what's great about this is that icon on its own can be by itself. And someone would see that later on down the road, say they became more popular. They would say, oh man, that's that really good vanilla extract that we had and that sugar, that infused sugar, you know? And they use rum in their extracts. So that's like another thing where they're like, yeah, it's such the best. And I've had it, it's very good. Um, and the Allen Raven can actually go on its own because of the typeface. And they can become one as one logo lockup. So this is, a, and so the husband liked this so much, he wants to get a tattoo of it on his arm. So I thought that was pretty cool. So I, I was like, that's, that's success. So this is what my process is. And like I said, that whole sketching thing doesn't happen that fast. And my word lists are longer usually. And sometimes I get stuck. Sometimes I just like have to walk away. Did you do anything for the restaurant Moon and Raven down there? I did not. I know the guy that did that logo though. Yeah. So, but yeah, but same thing, you know, like the Moon and Raven and putting those two things together. So, um, so what makes a logo successful and what makes a logo unsuccessful? So this is a long list, but, um, I'm going to go down very fast or I guess we have time, but, um, so this is what my, my interpretation of what a successful and unsuccessful logo is. Please feel free to screenshot this. Um, it, it will be helpful in the future. Um, so when you're looking around at logos, especially local logos, so I don't want to say any logos locally because there are a lot of bad logos out there. And I can say a few, but I don't want to because I don't want to offend anybody. <laughs> and there's a lot of times while I'm doing my work, we work here at the library, we work with a lot of outside you know, people like different charity organizations and I have to do their branding and and they're required to have the logo in there. And sometimes that makes it my job harder if the logo is terrible, because if it's pixelated, if it doesn't fit into every design. If it has a white background on it and I want it to be transparent, that takes me, that makes me have more time to put that logo the way I want it, you know, with no white background. Then I have to go into Photoshop. And so there's things that you can do with your logo that makes it easy for everybody around you while you're doing your marketing. So basically what I said before, proper representation of your mission or your brand, um, does it actually match your visual identity, like your mission, what you expect it to look like? Can it be resized from the size of a pen up to the size of a building without losing legibility? This is huge. So if your logo is pixelated, and it's not workable, then you're not going to be able to market with it. You're not going to be able to use that in your identity. So you have to be able to read that logo on a pen this size all the way up to the side of a building or a billboard. So if you want to market your business and you want to have a billboard with, your, with whatever you're doing, you have to be able to size that from this to a billboard. So that's very important. And that's where graphic designers come in. But you know, also if you can do it yourself, that'd be wonderful. Um, has to have a minimal and uncomplicated design with no more than two different typefaces. And the reason we say this is because once you get past two typefaces, it gets complicated and it gets illegible. You can't read it. So, or if you need to transfer that to something else, it, it just starts to get muddied and there's just too many typefaces, too many fonts. If you can stick with one, that's great. A two is usually the standard. Um, if your icon can stand on its own and if it can work as a pattern, that's not, that doesn't, you don't have to have it as a pattern, but if it does work as a pattern, that's a bonus. So even if, even if attributes of your logo work as a pattern, that's, that's beautiful. So think of Louis Vuitton, Coach. Um, there's a bunch of logos out there that they use as a pattern in like their logos in their pattern. So, wow, let's just market some more, you know, like, and people buy it. And like Chanel, Coco Chanel, they have the two C's. And if you see that, it's usually fashion. They do that a lot because they'll, they'll throw them the little things inside their, their patterns. Um, if it looks good in black and white, grayscale, and also white knocked out on a, on a dark background. So the reason I say this is because when you design in one color, if it looks good in that one color, sometimes people stop right there. So with that Owl and Raven, I didn't have to add color because they were like, wow, we really like this in black. 
it's like it matches. I could have made the eyes yellow. I did send them a comp that had yellow eyes. They were like, nope, one color is perfect. So, and then grayscale, what I mean by that is if you have a couple colors, say you have like three colors, but you want to save on printing. So letterheads, if you want to save on printing of your letterhead and it's a color print, you're going to pay more for that. So say you want to do it in black and white. Well, that logo has to look good in black and white also, which is grayscale. So like say a black and white photo, you know, you have to make sure that the contrast is good enough so that the letters pop, the icon pops. So that's what I mean by grayscale. And then white knocked out on a dark background is great because if you have photos of your product or if you have, if you are a photographer and you wanna put a watermark on your photos, the white washed out watermark is perfect because then people won't steal your photos for one. But um, then you can, you don't take away from the photo itself, but your logo is still there. So people still see it. And last, use a minimal color scheme. No more than two solid colors. Excuse me? Did you hear somebody whisper? <laughs> we heard you whisper. <laughs> but um, if you use minimal uh, color scheme, no more than two solid complementary colors. And I'm not going to get into color theory too much because you can Google color theory and you can look at the color wheel and figure out what things are complement complementary. And you'll know because if you look to the right, you'll see these are the colors that they call them complementary colors, but they glow. And so down here, I wanted to talk about the gradients too. So I would stick, I would stay away from gradients um, because with gradients, if it's not a solid color, what if you want to print it on a t-shirt? If you know anything about printing on a t-shirt, it, it has to be a screen print usually, or it has to be an applique. And the applique they can do in full color, but usually that peels off of a t-shirt. So if you want a t-shirt that sticks like, these two ladies in the back with the lock haven and the, what else, the, oh, look at that, the police box. So that's that's on like one color screen print. It's not in the fabric, it's, it's painted on top. So if that was a gradient, they can't do that screen print. So then you have to figure out how to get it so that it's one solid color, a couple solid colors. Um, but if it's a gradient or a rainbow or like anything like that, then they have to switch over to the applique or they have to sew it into the shirt itself. So, so that's, those are things you have to think of if you want to merchandise your, your brand and you want to have t-shirts or if you want to have polos with a little like your name on there, that's embroidered. So they have to sew that into the thing or, or they can screen print those also. So, so that's why I say stay away from gradient. And the value of the color, that's another color theory term, but the value of the color is basically the shade of that color. So these two, for a colorblind person, they wouldn't be able to distinguish between those two colors. So you have to think about the people of different abilities. If you have a colorblindness issue, you have to think about that. You have to think about it with web. You have to think about it with your letters that you're sending out. You have to think about it with your logo. Anything that you have, anything, you have to really look up the standards for ADA standards and how this is gonna affect either having, you know, when somebody's looking at your logo or looking at your website, if they can't read it, they can't read it and they're not gonna, so they'll just go on and move to the next thing. So those are the things that you have to worry about. Like, so my brother is colorblind, for instance, he can't see the difference between a traffic light. The only reason he knows it's green is because it's at the bottom. So the top is red and he can't distinguish that between two colors. So red and green are the two colors you shouldn't use together. So if you look over here, I've talked about the colors that don't work together. So the unsuccessful side is basically the opposite of everything I talked about on the successful side. These colors down here, they become muddy sometimes. So if I'm colorblind, I can't distinguish this. It'll look like maybe a little bit of a difference on the blocks, the two different blocks, but they won't be able to tell the color difference. So everything becomes muddy to somebody who has a colorblindness issue. And then if you look at this, you can see it even on the screen a little bit up here, it glows. So have you ever seen Christmas decorations that glow when they're bright red and bright green and you look at it and your eyes kind of wig out? Well, that's, that's because those colors are fighting against each other and they're considered contrasting or complementary. Carol Hill, bigger. Oh, so Can you please mute? Thank you. <laughs> um, the owl's talking to you. Yeah, the owl's talking to us. <laughs> so those two colors will glow. So like, if you're looking at that and it hurts your eyes, it's not going to be good, you know, when, you're, when your logo looks like that or when your merchandise looks like that. So these are the things you, all, you have to think about. 
So here are some very quick rundown. There's a lot of successful logos out there. I can't, you can't list them all. And if you want to look them up online, all you have to do is Google the most successful logos in history. And a lot of them are big companies, of course. And even the big companies have gone through a different process of refining their logos and it's changed. It happens, you know, the style of design from the eighties is totally different than the style of design from now. The style of design from the twenties is totally different than the eighties. And now what's interesting is some of that twenties, the twenties are coming back, you know, art deco is, uh, I mean, if you think about great, the, the great Gatsby, you know, so, and there's art nouveau, which is, uh, Alphonse Mucha with the flowers and the beautiful flowing vines. And that was a big thing back in the day. Now we're, we're going towards the clean, you know, legible logos. And the great thing is to see this process is look at these from 2019, all of them, What's, what's similar about all of these? The name. the name is gone. Yeah. So that is brand recognition. So these companies are like, wow, we, they don't need to see the name underneath. Everybody knows who Toyota is. They know who Pepsi is. Everybody knows the Shell gas stations. You know, they don't have to have the name underneath. Um, Starbucks is now just the lady, the fish lady, I call her, you know, so they, they don't have to have that there. So why take up more space for advertising when you can just put the icon on there? And that is brand recognition. Airbnb started out as like this fluffy thing and it just didn't work out. It didn't work anywhere they went. So this is, this represents a paper clip, I think, but I'm not sure, but um, they just simplified and look at this typeface. How beautiful that is. That font is so gorgeous because it's legible, it's clean. You can put that on a sign and you can put that on a pen. So think about that. And then Instagram had, this was actually very controversial when Instagram had changed over to this logo. They, they prided themselves on the fact that you could use filters that look like old Polaroids and they didn't want to get away from this vintage look. And there was a big push to not change their logo, but it ended up changing. And it still looks like a camera. It's just a more simplified version. So, and then look at Pepsi. Look how much they've gone through. I mean, it was Brad's drink to start. And then look at this typeface here. That's just, you can't even read it. And then, but this were all hand done. So now that machine, you know, machine type is here and machines do all the work for you. Um, well, you know, most of the time <laughs> the, uh, the Pepsi logo has streamlined and now it's to this and then here. So if you see that dot, you know what it is. So the next slide, I'm just gonna warn you, <laughs> there are some vulgar ones, but these are real logos. So all of these logos are real. These are out there. So they're inappropriate. The, like how did somebody not see that when they made these logos? And it's so weird. Like we all laugh, we all jest about it, but at the same time, I'm like, why would you do that? Who was the guy that said, yeah, that's a great logo. Put that on your product. You know, like, <laughs> come on, unless they were being funny, you know, but this dental one is the dental care one is real. That's out. Um, I don't know about the rest of these, but um, here's one that's a good example of gradients not working well, because how, are we, how would you put that on a t-shirt, you know, or even a sign that would be a hard one to do on a sign. This plumber um, 99 is cool looking. Like he's, very cartoon-like and he's fun. Maybe that's what they were trying to go for, you know? I don't know how plumbing is fun, you know? But um, they wanted to make him like the plumber. He's a cool guy, but that's so much information going on here. And there's three different typefaces here. This text or teacher, see, I can't even say it. Teacher's tech toolbox, don't ever use a large letter to, to uh, describe every word in your logo. It doesn't work out. To this, I don't even know what this is. I think it was supposed to be a keyhole for a toolbox and it's terrible. Like, I don't know who this company is, so I can say that. Um, this one is, I don't know if that's a joke, but um, we won't talk about that one. But then um, Kaz's sports bar, this is what I was talking about, the glowing. I don't know if you can see it on the projector. You can definitely see it on a computer screen. That bright yellow is a no-go. Like, don't do that. It's, it, and then the, the complementary color there, the contrasting color is that bright purple. And all three of these colors are the same value. So if this was in black and white or grayscale, it wouldn't pop because the yellow would be gray, like a light gray. The other, this would be about a medium gray. And then this cyan blue would probably be a medium gray. It would just look like a blob of gray. So either take one color away and then the yellow is what I would recommend. Yes? Or put it up on a big screen like this. Yeah. 
can sit back and look at it. And if you can't, if it's not legible, right? Yeah. You know, or you see inappropriate right. sign. Exactly. <laughs> Yeah, so the best thing to do is step back. That's a, that, I mean, and we did that when I was in art school. Uh, we would draw, and our teacher would make us step back. So, you know, when you're drawing, you're up close all the time. And when you're on the computer, you're up close. Always bring yourself back and look at it and say, if I was standing on the ground looking at a billboard, how would this look? And that, that would be, I mean, this might be a really fun place, and they might lose business because people don't understand. Like, they can't read it, you know, or... They go in there and it might be wonderful inside, but because the logo is terrible, I mean, me personally, I would be like, yeah, it looks cheesy. You know, I, won't, I don't want to go there. See, so it's kind of like that's a, a local joint that everybody knows. Like there's a, a restaurant around here that has a logo you can't see. Yeah. If you're driving down the highway at 70 miles an hour, it just looks like a loop. Yep. We know what it is because yeah. we live here. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot. There's a lot around here actually like that too. Yeah. And, the, and the, speaking of billboards, I'm not touching on billboards today, but I'm going to give you a tip on billboards. Don't ever put more than one line of text. Yeah. It sounds so weird. When I worked with Clyde Peeling and I did his billboards, hey. uh, he's Thank you. He's he's amazing. He he. Um, oh, when you can you please mute? I think it's Becky. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because you got to. Um. So when I worked with Clyde Peeling, um. He was awesome because he said, I know that I drive fast on the highway and I know that I can only read so much on, on the highway. Three seconds at 70 miles an hour. Yeah, exactly. And, and we also have a very short attention, attention span as, you know, just as humans in general, we all have short attention spans, especially now with social media and digital, digital push of everything in your face. But um, so when I designed his, his billboards, he asked me, he said, just put the logo and what exit it is. He said he doesn't even want the website on there anymore. It used to be the website, the phone number, the logo, a snake, a lizard, or whatever was on there. And then he streamlined it. And then when, when I um, had him as a client, um, at that point, he got to the point where he just wanted an animal, the logo, and the exit. And it's perfect. It works great. And he likes the dark background because it pops in the day and it pops in the night. So I did, I did a few, I did a other Chester billboard for him that was very light colored and he didn't like it. It was going to be like a children's book where the uh, dinosaurs and the lizards came out of the children's book. Um, but because the background was light colored during the day on the vinyl boards, it just reflected the light. So, and then these are the things you have to think about, you know, so when you're, even if you're not doing it, if you're a graphic designer or whoever's your illustrator that's working with you, these are the things you have to think about when you're, you're going through this process. So here are some logos, other logos that I have done. Um, if you like, you can check my website out in the future too, but it's stonerootstudio.com. I don't actually think we're, we're rebuilding it right now, but um, this, these are logos that I've done over time. And these started out from, this was probably 2013. And then the most recent one I did was this Arizona Sunset Golf Association. So I have logos all over the place, but um, they, the clients I have, what's nice is that's the great thing about being uh, also digital is I can do anything for anybody in the world. I have stuff over in Switzerland, or not Switzerland, sorry, Finland, and I have um, artwork actually in Saudi Arabia. So it's great. It's like it's, you can work with people all over the world and send them their, their files. Um, this, this woman right here, I just found her through um, a friend and she was like, I see you do graphic design. This is a friend of mine. And she actually drew this herself. She signed it for me. And then I digitized her signature. That was the easiest logo I have ever done in my life. And she's a good friend of mine, but at the same time, it's all I had to do was put a nice typeface underneath and block it out like a sign. And she had done all of the work for me because she's an artist. Um, so, th so this is, I would, I would consider this probably my more successful logos. This one is probably my least successful, but this is what the client wanted. So that's the one thing too, is like, you, you can say, you should do it this way. You should do it this way. But if the client doesn't want that, then you have to go with what they want because they're the ones, you know, and you don't have to work with everybody either, but she wanted it to be a tag also. So when it's on a tag, it's perfect. And then she also made a sew-in tag into her, the stuff that she makes. Okay, <laughs> so this is one of my favorite videos because we're going to segue over into um, into typefaces. Does anybody have to use the bathroom or does anybody have questions or anything? Okay. 
All right, so this was an SNL skit a couple years ago. And uh, so there's a big joke in the graphic design world. There's typefaces you just don't use. Don't use them. So <laughs> Papyrus, Comic Sans, Hobo, and Apple Chancery was another one, and Zaffino. So we're starting to get away from some of these, these logos or these typefaces. So the funny thing is, the movie Avatar used Papyrus for the whole movie. Even the newest one that just came out, they used this, that used it for the subtitles. So this is a funny video in the design world, but it's also just fun. Why? What other ones? What other ones? Um, so Comic Sans yeah. was the other one, and Hobo. Um, and we don't use a lot of Apple Chancery or Zapfino. So it, it's funny because it all sounds so nerdy, but um, uh, it's, it's, it's important. Um, papyrus is too stretched out. Um, it's, it's, you can't it legibly read it when it okay. comes to certain letter, letters. And I do actually have an uh, example coming up here. But um, and Comic Sans, they, they, I don't know why Comic Sans became so popular. I think Microsoft Word made it really mm -hmm. popular. It and it, because it's a friendly font, they call it, it it's, seems like it's fun. Um, they do use it, something similar in comic books, but it's um, the old school comic books were done by hand. So mm -hmm. that was all hand done type way back in the day. And some people, some, some vintage type comic book artists still get a hand letter to do their comic books because they don't believe in machine type. So they don't believe in the machine making the type for their comic books. So, um, but there are other comic fonts that are more legible and there's other like tribal fonts that are more legible than papyrus. It's, it's, and then there's no other families for papyrus either. So like when you have Arial, you um, have Arial bold, you have italic, you have sometimes condensed extra, extra wide. So they have all these different families underneath the font family that in different versions that you can use. Papyrus doesn't have anything. So, and neither does Comic Sans and neither does Hobo. And, and so that they're just those things that you have to stay away from. So typefaces, fonts, and logo lockups. Um, do you, and then the next thing after that will be, do you absolutely need an icon in your logo? So why is the choice of font so important? <laughs> Legibility, yeah. So what I did is I sat down and I typed out a bunch of different legibility, the word legibility in different fonts. And this down here is the worst thing ever, like the the uh, script fonts. You know, it, now if you're going to use a script font, use it like this, where the first letter is capitalized or or not, but make it look like it's handwriting. You know, not every because you don't really when you write in script anyway, you don't do this fancy stuff like this, and you can't read any of that. So this is actually the word legibility, this bottom one, you know, and I can't read that. I only know it says that because I typed it. So even this one, this big blocky one is cool, but it's hard to read. So imagine being far away from that, you know, the tiny little circles here in the B, like you can't really read them. This one's a little too condensed. So, but the ones that I think are good on here, the, here's Comic Sans right here. It's too bubbly and too, you know, it's just, it's too spread out. But this one here is kind of like a bubbly font and I call it a friendly font and it looks pretty good. You know, that would look nice as like maybe an ice cream logo or something like that. So these are the things you have to think about when, you know, can you read it? And like you said earlier, if you can step back and look at it and read it and then you're good. So is an icon necessary in a logo? Do you all think that an icon is necessary? Depends. What, how does it depend? Um, if the customer or intended customer is seeing it for the first time, it needs to be clear. But after you've established the communication, then you can just do the, like Louis Vuitton, you could just do the two letters. Yeah. But you have to establish your brand before you get away with that. Right. So did do you think that like IBM and Coca-Cola ever had an icon with their, with their logos? Or did their logo become the icon? Hmm. I have to think back to both yeah. of those. So, because like this top line here, like Google, did Google ever have just an icon? Like, so that it, it was yeah. like, mm. yeah, like McDonald's where they had the, so yeah, so they, NASA, NASA had, they did have the 
spaceship, but they never did right. it by, the, they, they had the shuttle, but they never did it by itself. It yeah. always said NASA across it. So all of these can independently work on their own. Canon, I don't think ever had uh, mm -hmm. an icon either. So, and the cool thing about the FedEx, uh, look at the little thing they did here with this arrow in between the E and the X. Mm -hmm. They did that on purpose. So Amazon, what do you think the Amazon logo means? Think about the Amazon logo. Oh, the smile. The smile. It also, where does the arrow point, the smiley arrow, where does it point on the letters? Right. Everything from A to Z. Correct, yes. So Amazon, when they designed that logo, they purposefully put it from A to Z in the word Amazon. So the arrow points from A to Z. Amazon has everything that they do, everything from A to Z. And then everybody's happy when they see that box on the porch. So there's the smile. So this, this is the savvy things that, and they sit down for, for months sometimes to come up with these, especially the big corporate organizations sit down for months to come up with these. And uh, Chanel was one of the ones I said, they have used this in patterns. Louis Vuitton, they use in pattern. So Louis Vuitton had also switched to a, um, a cleaner font as the word, as their title, but they left the old font as their, their icon. So what is a logo lockup? When I refer to a logo lockup, it means basically the symbol, the word mark, and the tagline are all one. Sometimes the logo can work independently. Sometimes you can break them apart and the, the icon can work independently. Sometimes you can't. So the logo lockup is when you have everything together. Sometimes they'll have like, um, like uh, let me think, nationwide, life is on, what's that one? Nationwide is on your side. So they have a tagline too underneath. So I do a law office and they have um, their law name, their law office name. And then underneath it says attorneys at law. So that's their slogan, but they don't have to put that on every single thing that they print. They can just put their name on there too. So um, Wendy's can do the same. I mean, these are just some, some examples. And um, I, but you wouldn't, you wouldn't see is on your side by itself because you wouldn't know what that means. So, but you can see nationwide by itself and the N with the bird, you can see that by itself and you know it's nationwide. So that's what I, when I refer to a logo lockup. So the eagle, when I did the owl and the raven, the icon can be by itself. But when I, as soon as I put owl and raven underneath, that's the complete logo lockup. And if they wanted to put a slogan underneath, like the best vanilla extract ever, you know, whatever, they can do that too. So, so now I'm going to be one style guides. So I'm going to speed it up here a little bit so I don't keep you any longer than 3.30. Um, so style guides are very important for your brand. So they are um, basically telling everybody around you how to use your logo. So if you're a bigger business and other people are going to be touching your logo and using your logo, a style guide is very important. So even if you have a printer, like if you have a printing company that you send your stuff to to get merchandise, they need to know this stuff. So if a graphic designer is working with you, this is great because usually they do this. Most graphic designers will, or illustrators or even web designers will do this. They know the colors that need to go onto the merchandise. So for James B. Brown, I made this, this sheet up. And um, if you guys want to take pictures of this, feel free or screenshot. Um, so these are the rules at the bottom here, what I'm allowed to do with my logo, with this logo. Um, when I got here, I actually, um, streamlined our logo a little bit down here is you can't really see it but it's it was a little smushed and so when I got here I, I asked if I could streamline the J a little bit I told them that I put the J on a diet because the it was really wide and it was some sometimes I don't know if it got smushed along the line um, maybe someone had resized it and then it just stayed that way for a while so um, the original logo was done by hand so it then became um, digital and then over time it became pixelated. So that was the other thing I needed to do was change it over so that I could blow it up really big and use it. You know, so this is why it's important to have a vector image, which is something that's done in a like a illustrative program that you can put on a pen, but then also stretch it and you know, not stretch it, but size it up to big size. So I um, had streamlined this and then that made me um, that gave me freedom to change the color of the logo. So in our style guide, we are allowed to change our color of the logo. And what I do is I, I brand it to whatever I'm marketing. So I can even put little cartoons on top of our logo because I made the style guide. So I can say, as long as you can see the logo, you can modify it any way you want, other than smushing it, stretching it, tilting it, 
or changing, like taking the pages out or anything like that. So that would be breaking your logo basically. So if you're sending this to a printer, you can send the style guide with it and you can say, here are my colors. Here's the size this is supposed to be. This is the lineup, like right here, this O has to sit right there where the middle is. And here's the typefaces. So it has all the things you could possibly need. This is what I did for my personal business, my side hustle. Um, I had just done a rebranding in would have been 2021 in the spring. And I changed my business to a creative studio rather than just graphic design alone. Cause I'm, I'm also, I do all kinds of different mediums. So I made it as just a creative studio. And I used to have a tree because it was stone root studio. And the reason I started out at stone root is because I was a ceramic artist and um, I love trees. So this is the two reasons why I made my name stone root studio. And it was a tree. And then underneath it said Stone Road Studio. But because I branched out now over, to over time, I did a rebrand. And then what's great is I can use this S on things. And that's my, I, my iconography or it's my little tiny favicon that I can use on websites. And if I just want to put an S on a sticker, then they know that's Stone Road Studio. All right, so let me make this real quick. So where to use your branding and when to use your branding. So this is all just general information um, from here on out, and um, we'll talk about, I've already talked about most of this stuff, so I'll, I'll keep it very brief, but um, if you want to take a picture of this, these are pretty much, if you want to market your business and you want your name out there, put it on everything. It sounds weird, and it sounds obnoxious, but if you want people to start to know you and know what your icon is, then put it on everything. Um, so print media, that goes from everything from a business card, letterhead, flyers, all the way up to vehicle reps. Digital media, it could be social media. Um, if you ever need a social media marketer and you're not good at it, hire someone to social media for media market for you because social media marketing is a full-time job. It sounds so weird, but like if you wanna keep up on Instagram, you wanna keep up on TikTok, you wanna keep up on Snapchat, all of these platforms that you want your brand to be out there and you don't have time to do it, then hire a social media marketer. It's it's worth every penny because that's something that like even James E. Brown, we, we're on everything. And other than TikTok, we're not on there yet, but we might be soon. So, but um, we, we use those platforms to reach all demographics. So we have kids that are on Snapchat and TikTok. We have adults that are on um, Facebook and what's the other one? We have Instagram. And so we... Those are, those are reaching different demographics because our demographic here at James E. Brown Library is zero to 100. So that is the age group that we're trying to reach. Some brands are only trying to reach a, a small pocket of people. So they just will only market on TikTok or they'll only market on Snapchat. So it just depends on what your demographic is. So basically at the bottom there, depending on your demographic and your target market, that then you will figure out your placement of your marketing materials. So how do we use our brand? Everywhere. <laughs> and this is just, I seriously just walked around for 10 minutes yesterday and just walked around the library and took pictures of things. And there are icons on everything, all the way down to these cute little bookmarks that we put in our books when we recommend books. So not only is our face on there and you know the different librarians that work here, but we also have at the bottom our website and our icon, just in case. Another good thing to use is QR codes. If you want to drive, um, if you want to drive stuff to a website, you can use QR codes. I don't know if you can see this one up here at the top here. That's a QR code. And if you go on a website called QR Generator, you can get free QR codes and they don't expire. So some of those, some of those free things expire. So the one that I go on, um, I use the free version and that QR code won't expire because, you know, and then if you want to pay for the site, you know, have a subscription then you know, you'll have it. All right, so the last thing is merchandise. I've already talked about it. You can print your logo on everything. I even have, I designed this Salty Sisters logo that's in North Carolina. Uh, that is butter. So the logo I designed is in butter. Like, that's so weird, you know? Like, <laughs> who puts your logo on butter? But every time she's a food truck, and so every time she would serve breakfast on Saturday mornings and, and Sunday mornings on the beach, she would have a little butter pad in there that had her logo on it. And it's just another opportunity, you know? So, and then this is a golf club in, for veterans in um, Arizona. And there are so many opportunities. You can get embroidered on shirts. And because this is a clean logo, 
it's easy to embroider and it's easy to put on small things and like a golf ball. So, and then here's examples of our James U. Brown merchandise. Uh, we did have a sale. We had two sales with Graphic Hive. Um, the top, the top designs did not get approved because they, the type of printing press that they had could not print that style on the side. I wanted the big window. So that's our, that's our rotunda window. I wanted it to wrap around so that on the back you'd see half and on the front you'd see half, but they didn't have that ability to, to print that way. So this is another thing you got to think about when you're it's like, okay, can this printer do this for me? Is this possible? And I thought it would have looked super cool on a hoodie because you know, the hoodie kind of cuts it off here and then it would have wrapped around. But who did they, who did they print for you? Oh, uh, Graphic Hive. Oh, okay. Yep, they're but awesome. There are, I know there are printers that are capable. Yeah, yep. So, um, yeah, and um, locally I have a list here too. And I gave you guys all lists. Um, I forgot to put Moonlight Graphics on there for printing. So if you want to write that under there, Moonlight Graphics is also a local printer place that's really great. And then this design here is actually the stained glass windows on the sides of the old building, of the original building. And I um, image traced it and made it into a flat colored icon. So, but um, that's the things that, you know, these things are everywhere. We had two sales already, I think, and we have people wearing our, sheet, our shirts all over the place. And then Rogers Uniforms does them for us for in-house where if we want just the logo, like a nice polo or a, or a blouse, they'll do that for us too. So, and then here are the resources that I passed out. Um, if you're at home and you want to screenshot this, this is a good time to do that. Um, so these are places that will help you achieve your brand. So you guys can look down those and then I have actual names too on the next slide. So, but um, another cool idea is if you don't wanna spend a lot of money, but you wanna get a really nice logo and you also wanna give somebody some experience, call the colleges locally. So call like a, like like Cumming College here, Pennsylvania College of Technology. They have and Penn College right now. Their design department is amazing, and I don't just say that because I graduated from there. They are winning awards left and right. They they have some really amazing professors there right now, and um, these kids are coming out getting jobs. Their hiring rate right now is like ninety eight percent. So um, sometimes seniors or even juniors. Um, at the colleges, they'll need work. So they need to get their portfolio built and they're allowed to use what they do on the outside in their senior portfolio. So if they do a logo on the outside of school, it's not a school project, they can put that in the portfolio. And then when they go for a job, they can have that, you know, that everything in their portfolio. So it's, it's kind of nice. And they don't, I'm not gonna say what they charge because I don't really know, but most of the time students will charge a little less and then it gives them the experience. It gives you the experience also to work with a graphic designer. And then you might make a connection later on down the road when they have, you know, they're working at a firm or if they have their own studio, you might go to work with them again and they could make you websites and stuff like that. So, so I recommend contacting Penn College and Lyco for student work if you, if you don't want to um, pay a lot or if you want to give somebody some experience and I always recommend going local first because local you can talk to them you can meet them face to face also if you happen to not get a file that didn't transfer the right way they can bring a thumb drive to you and transfer the files so this is the local stuff I pass this out to the people here in the room and then those of you those of you that are at home please screenshot this and I'm also recording it um, but these are a uh, the websites uh, that I put at the bottom are like lists of different places online that you can do. And then the very bottom right here is uh, very high end um, design companies, but you can see their work, which is cool. They always put their work out there. So, um, so if you're feeling up to the challenge, this is the list of things to use to do your own logo. If you feel like you're um, capable to do them yourselves, this is a great list. Um, Canva is free, and can, I'm, I don't know if any of you have heard of Canva or used Canva before. It's free, and the paid version is amazing too, and it's not super expensive, so um, it's great. You can do everything in Canva. I'm not going to bring up the website because we don't have time, but um, you can do logos, you can do pamphlets, you can do posters. I mean, websites. You can you can do everything on it. It's it's so much fun, and they have stock photos, they have stock um, graphics, and it's so easy. And you hit click. I want it to be a PNG. I want it to be a JPEG. I want it to be a PDF. I want it to be a GIF. You can even do moving graphics in Canva, and this is what I recommend to our our district libraries because I do I do graphic design for the whole district also. So I do forty four libraries, and um, what I recommend to them is you know if they want to dabble you know and get in there and and make flyers, it's a perfect. Um, 
service to use. So, and then I was gonna try to show you guys this, but please take a picture of this. Um, you have to research these websites. So the AI race is on. And I say that because within the last week they have released AI art generation, like bam, like everybody's on board now. So Microsoft Bing is now, Microsoft owns Bing now. So it's called the new Bing. And if you can go on there and if you have a Microsoft suite account already, you can sign in, you just sign into your Microsoft and you can start messing with AI. Now this is image generation. So you, it's from text to image. So you can type in the weirdest thing ever and a picture will pop up. So I tried a furry frog with a top hat on sitting on top of a dog's head and a cigar in his mouth. And sure enough, it gave me a furry frog and it looked, and then they give you four options. And then Adobe Firefly is um, even more in depth. So Adobe Firefly will actually do um, imagery where you can have a photo and you can erase the shirt and say, I would like this person to be wearing a leather jacket. And they pop it on there and it looks like the guy's wearing a leather jacket. It's really weird. They can change the facial features. So if you're on TikTok and you see those filters where your face moves, this is all machine learning. This is all AI generated stuff. Um, they can make his face smile, they can make it sad, they can move his eyebrows up. And what's great about this for us as graphic designers or marketers or even business owners, you can go on there and say, I want a logo for, you can say, draw me a logo of an ice cream truck with a clown on top. And it will make you a logo that's an ice cream truck with a clown on top holding an ice cream cone. I mean, it's the colors, everything. And then they're not real great with text yet. But if you have the icon, that can also just give you ideas. So you can go to a graphic designer and say, I want something like this. And it's all, it's all Creative Commons. So the thing about Adobe, what's nice is they already have a stock account. So they draw from Creative Commons. The stuff is already owned by Adobe. So they're not stealing other people's artwork. And that's what, what the, the big push was, is where are they getting this artwork? So Adobe is nice because they already, so I recommend you research this. When, when you see it, your jaw will drop and even my jaw dropped. And so, but that is it. <laughs> Sorry, I was trying to rush there the last 15 minutes. I thought that I could uh, slow down and actually take the time, but does anybody have any more questions? If you already have a logo and you're, and you're pretty happy with it, but like I learned today, like something I might want to tweak. Yeah. Is there is there a way to do you just dive in and the next time you order your your labels, you just have the tweaked version? Like, mm -hmm. like what's the I mean like yeah. you're changing it midstream in some sense. Yeah, I would say um like you could change anytime you want. So that's so if you go ahead, sorry. Yes, I guess my question is so like so if I have 10 of something with mm -hmm. the old la label right. and I order new labels, is there any, like, I don't know, does it matter? Um, I don't think it does. If you're, if you're, is it going to be similar to the original logo that you have? Yeah. yeah. I think as long as the attributes look very similar, you can do kind of a slow trickle into the new one and you can sell out of your old things and like, don't, like, don't just not sell those, you know, like actually the right. old base. What you spent just, yeah. And then you can even put like, say um, you could put like a little note that we're rebranding, you know, it's, it's, it's a process we're rebranding. So like, a, cause like, for instance, I was Stone Root Studio, I had a tree and it was kind of like a classic looking tree. And then all of a sudden I'm like, bam, it's just this font, you know? So it's a total different color even. I just used to use black and white. And so, um, okay. Yeah. And I would, um, when I would, when I changed over, I just basically put a little thing on my Instagram and put a little thing on my Facebook. And I said, you know, we're rebranding, so bear with us type of thing. Okay. She says, thank you. Awesome. And thank you for coming. What's that? Okay, I can do that. Yes, good idea. So does anybody else have any other questions? Yes. I just have a quick question about events that maybe you're, your co-branding, um, like a parent organization with a regional branch. Do you have any advice or thoughts on? Um, I always, when we when we co-brand here, we do a lot because we have a lot of uh, workshops and stuff where they'll we have to put the brand on. 
the marketing or someone sponsoring the event. That's the big thing is because if they gave us money, the brand has to be on there. So for, for instance, our author gala, we have a lot of people that give money for the author gala. So part of their money uh, contri contribution is that they get their logo in the, in the thing per however much they give. And so the one thing I always ask for as a graphic designer is please send me a high resolution logo with no background, a PNG. That's the biggest thing. Like those are the keywords. Send me a PNG with no white background and high resolution. And the problem is that some people don't know how to do that. So that's the thing is like, um, so what happens on my end, um, sometimes I have to take their logo and take it into Photoshop and make sure it's not pixelated. And then I take the white background out. Now I know how to do all that, but not everybody knows how to do that. So I always make sure I'm like, and most places are getting on board now. They're starting to understand that they don't do that blocky thing, you know, where they have a white background and then the logo, because what if you have a bunch of those, as soon as you overlap those, that's gonna cut out of the other logos. So you not having a white background is perfect because then if you have a logo that's this shape and you have a logo that's this shape, they can sit real closely together without a white box around them. And then they're not bumping in and covering each other and you have to bring one forward on your pamphlets and, and on Microsoft Word, it's even harder because you have to float the image somewhere and the text has to be you know, in the front and the picture has to be, it's, it's a pain in the butt, it really is. And so across the board, if you are asking for a logo for a sister brand, or even if you're having an event where it's like a lot of different companies coming, just ask the graphic designer, ask the marketing person, please send me a high resolution PNG, no white background. So yeah, so PNGs are normally transparent, they're transparency. So, but that way you can work with them. But now if they don't have that, then you just kind of have to work with it. So, and there's a lot of things I do where um, I get frustrated because, you know, it's, this logo doesn't fit right, you know, and how, and then I have to design around that logo. And, and it, I, it's nothing against the people that made the logo. It's just, it makes my job slower. And also I have to work at getting the white background out. And then I have to, you know, increase the resolution so that it fits here and there. And it, it gets tough sometimes. So, but I think times are changing. People are starting to catch up, you know, so did that answer your question? Yeah. Good. I wanted to ask your opinion about white lettering on dark background. I, my wife and I were working with an organization here locally for several years and she was doing the website. She had lots of bright colors, mm -hmm. very lively, uh, dark print on lighter background. Right. This guy came along and said, well, that's out of the day. We, the, more, the current thinking is everything's black and all this white outline. And so he took it over and you couldn't read it in my um, administration. Right. So I don't know what was going on there, why that, when I see something that's dark, like whether it's a brochure or a, uh, a website that's mm -hmm. got a dark background with light print or dark one dark, I've even seen that. Right. Yeah. But it was so difficult to read. I right. don't know why people do that. <laughs> yeah, I don't either, honestly. Um, and that's why I stress the whole ADA, you know, ADA approved type. And also uh, people are, um, if they're dyslexic, you know, so um, I get what you're saying because if you ever look at theater programs are a prime example. So theater programs, um, they always want to make them dark. I don't know why, because you're in the dark. Why would you want to read something that's dark while you're in the dark? So when I would design, I designed for the Community Arts Center briefly a, a couple of years ago, and I made their programs bright, light, bright, larger type. And so you don't have to sit there with your cell phone or a flashlight and read it, you know, and, and then you're annoying the person behind you because you're trying to read it. And uh, so you're right, they shouldn't do that. And then if you're gonna, if you're going to do a dark background, bold type is the way to go. So to knock it out in bold type, not skinny lines, not smooshed together, and then find somebody that doesn't see well and ask them, can you read this? Yeah. Because it's, that's the best way to do it. If you don't see well too, take your glasses off, you know, and try to read it or put it back here, you know, or put it real close. And if you can't read it, then sure enough, 90% of the other people can't. I mean, I'm so, so used to reading books and books are usually right. white background right. and a dark print. Correct. Yep. So you, why would you change it to dark to white? Right. On it in a... Yeah, sometimes people want to be edgy. So, 
But a lot of times also the printing might have been miscommunicated also. So maybe on screen, when you design that, that program or design that, that piece, it looked great. But then as soon as it gets in print, it doesn't look good. So you also should do test prints of your, of your stuff. So if you're gonna go to a printer and say, I need 100 brochures of this, but can I have a copy first? Can I have a comp? You need to see a, a sample before. Don't just trust them, especially staples. Not that against staples, they don't have very good printed stuff. So when they're, when they're it's cheap, but you get what you pay for. So if you go to staples and say, I would like this printed, but I wanna see a copy before you print out all of the 100 yeah. whatever, then they'll give it to you, they have to. So, and then you just get that with the rest. And if you don't like it, then you can say, I'll pay for that one print and move on, go to the next guy. We're, but, we're in the process of putting a brochure together. And I had a, a lady take our logo and, and some other stuff. And I think she sent me seven different uh, styles of uh, right. brochures. And we looked at different ones because you don't want to take the first thing without right. printing it out and seeing how it's going to look. Right. It, yeah. Yeah, we on do the it. Screen, it looks one way. Yeah. yeah, yeah, we do that here. We we have an admin team that approves all of my designs, and so um, a lot of times I'll print it out for them. So especially if it's going to be in print, if it's a program or something like that. But if it's going to be digital, I mean, most of the time we just pass it around digitally. But the we do the uh, friends newsletter. So we do the um, shades of brown newsletter. I design that. So that's in print. It's getting mailed out. So you need to see what it looks like before it gets sent out. And the typeface is huge on that because back in the day. Um, I don't want to get too nerdy on you, but uh, sans serif type is the kind that doesn't have the little ticks at the bottom. Serif typeface was from, they call it a slab typeface because it started when they started um, carving into stone and they needed that little hash there so that when they carved into that, it stopped. Right. So that's where serif typeface came from. And traditionally in printing, they started out from the very beginning in serif typeface. So then when sans serif came around, that's a digital font. So as soon as computers were invented and we started doing things on Microsoft Word, sans serif was the best way to read on screen because the ticks, they, they still are good for fluency and reading, but it's cleaner. And then Helvetica was invented and Helvetica is sign font. And that's why sign font for any of the street signs, that's a Helvetica font. It's a sans serif, so it doesn't have. And if you notice, when they changed out the street signs, you can read them better with the from the serif font that had the ticks to the sans serif. And it's amazing that, that because of computers, how much we've changed, you know, with even with books. I mean, when I read my Kindle, I still want a serif font because it just feels like I'm reading a book then, you know, but some people can switch it over to sans serif. So speaking yeah. of fonts, what do you think of calligraphy and Lucinda? Yep, Lucinda. Font? Yep. It's what? pretty. I, I wouldn't use it for certain. It, it, I think it depends what you're using it for. So that's the one thing about any script font. Um, if it's something fancy and you want to do like a fancy font, that's great. But it has to match what you're doing it or what you're using it for, you know. So and like I like a few script fonts, but not very many. So it just depends on what it is. So I mean, I've used it a little bit for a like a tagline or a, or, or something on a poster. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But uh, yeah, I wouldn't want a whole brochure or a whole thing. Right. It. Yeah. Yeah. That would be Unless overwhelming. Maybe it's a wedding invitation. Yeah. Might be all right. Yeah. And a, a lot of people have a hard time reading cursive now, too, and, yeah. and calligraphy. So I guess they don't even teach it in school. Yeah, anymore. they don't. Yeah. <laughs> so, but any other questions or online? Do we have any other questions? All right. So thank you, everybody, for coming. And thank you, everybody, online. So good. it was good. so nice to meet you. I hope you, hope you learned something. I did record this. And also, if you want a copy of um, this, this um, whole slideshow, I can send it to you. So if you just want to leave me your email address, does somebody have a question? Oh, she's clapping. Yay. Oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs>